Well, good morning. My name is Chuck. In case you forgot, <laughs> I was just telling Don in the early service that uh, two weeks ago this morning, we were all gathered on the southern steps of the Temple of Herod over in Jerusalem in the middle of our tour that we were leading and what an experience that was. And we are grateful for your prayers for us. We, uh, of course, are dependent upon that as the Lord provides protection, uh, safety, and of course, freedom from uh, difficulty with that many people. There are a lot of logistics, 14 buses, 700 people, a little less. And uh, it was wonderful. We had, we had no accidents. We had no serious illness. We are grateful that uh, the Lord uh, brought us there and brought us back. Uh, you could have prayed a little harder on our trip back because the jet lag has been a drag, I'll tell you. Had I preached last Sunday, I'd have slept through my own message. And so <laughs> I chose to have... Uh, of Michael Easley stay at it one more Sunday and we're grateful for Michael's very faithful service here as he preached those three Sundays. You certainly did not go hungry. You were very well fed by that uh, faithful expositor and I'm grateful for him. Thank you sincerely for praying for us. We are, we are grateful to be back and to be with you and, and to know that, that the Lord's hand uh, was evident. There were a number of people who came to Christ as a result of being there, and uh, most had never been to the land of Israel, so it's always fun to introduce them to places they've read about but have never seen. And uh, that was, uh, again, another time of delight to be there with them. If you're a guest of ours today, we're so glad you visited, and we thank you for coming. We welcome you who are with us online, worshiping with us from all around the world. It's always pleased to have you as a part of our congregation. It's quite likely you don't know the ones sitting even close to you. So we take time, maybe 60 seconds or so, to stand up, stretch our legs, and say hello to somebody we've not met before. Would you do that? Just reach out and greet them with a warm hello. Good, thank you. Thanks so much. You're in for a treat with our youth choir this morning. We'll enjoy a very special couple of numbers that they do so beautifully. I always look at them and think there is our future. Those are the ones who will be leading the ministry in the years ahead. I want you to know a little about what we have planned for what's coming for the summer and even before then. We've saved it for you on, on the video. We call it our Stonebriar Minute. Today it's without words. Just follow along and listen closely and enjoy the upbeat presentation of what's in the future. Watch closely.
movie, uh, that video reminds me of, of the old silent movies, you know, where, where nobody said anything. Now, I've never, I was not alive when, when those were shown, but Chuck has them all memorized. All those silent movies, yeah. He'd sing along with it. Good morning. Good to see you. We are so proud of our youth choir. The youth choir was started here about 14 years ago. Misty Miller started the choir. And then a couple of years ago, uh, she retired from that position. And Ken Seeloff is now the director. What a great group of kids, and they sing so well. They're going to lead us in worship this morning. After their call to worship, uh, some of the students will come forth. There are five seniors in the group, senior in high school, and they're going to lead us in a responsive reading, and you'll be able to follow that up on the screen. They will speak, and then we'll reply. They will speak again, and we will reply. But uh, before they even sing one note of music, uh, let's welcome them and encourage them to be. Congregation, please stand. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He is king of kings and Lord. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names. He is king of kings and Lord of lords. 
At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is
For several weeks now, I've looked forward to a series that I would be bringing to you on the fruit of the Spirit, not the gifts of the Spirit or the conviction of the Spirit, but the fruit. The teaching is found in Galatians chapter 5, <clears throat> and it is invaluable for the Christian if we hope to live in the realm of victory in our lives rather than struggle in the darkness of defeat. It's all up to our decision as we will hear and as we will see in the scriptures. Not enough is said about this and I would imagine it's been a while since any of you have heard teaching on this subject. Paul is a master on the subject and brings it up several times in his letters, none better than in Galatians chapter 5. If you have your Bible with you, please uh, locate verse 16 in that fifth chapter and follow along with me as I read down through verse 23. This is sort of the uh, ground zero on the teaching of the fruit of the Spirit. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. You follow along in your version, it's very similar, and we will see what the Lord says to all of us in the days to come. My hope is to take time for each of the fruit mentioned in verses 22 and 23, as we'll read in a few moments. Galatians 5, beginning at verse 16. Please stand with me for the reading of the scriptures and remain standing for prayer. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life, meaning habitually living in that realm, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Now please read with me, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Bow with me for prayer, please. What a wonderful world this would be if those nine qualities were constantly on display. First within our own private lives and then around the circle of our family life. 
among life with our friends, fellow workers, and even among those we are just meeting who are total strangers. What a great day it would be if love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control were on display. How we need these qualities in this lost, dying, and desperate world. We pray that they might begin within us, that we might realize the battle that goes on within, longing for control of our lives. And may we, in the process of realization, come to terms with that marvelous ability of the Spirit of God to produce through us these qualities that are Christ-likeness on display. Help us, I pray, as we are involved in the lives of so many, to begin to live in such a way that Christ is seen in us. Our hearts go out to those who hurt today. I think especially of Charlton Hyatt, our beloved friend in ministry, who has lost his dear mother this, just yesterday. I pray for him and for Ginger that you'd give them extra strength as they prepare for that time of memorial as they remember their dear mother, that godly life and her faithfulness to her family. Comfort them in their grief. Meet their needs with extra strength. Come alongside them, Father, and may your spirit bring to them what no one else can bring, divine assistance in dealing with the grief of life. Prepare all of us, our Father, for these days ahead whatever they may bring. And Father, I ask that you would give us the kind of strength we need to face the challenges, whether it be of COVID or some other disease or virus, some challenge dealing with children or adults that are in our lives, problems with others that are unresolved, conflicts that seem so complicated there isn't a solution whereas you know the answer to each one we commit them to you we commit ourselves to you that we might walk with you in such a way that we please you and fulfill your wish and your plan for our lives now lord our gifts come to you but in reality, they are first your gifts to us. Thank you for providing for us so bountifully. May these gifts that come be used wisely and well by this ministry and beyond these walls. May integrity mark the way they are handled and bless those who give with generosity and faithfulness. Use them to sustain this ministry and ministries beyond our own. Thank you in advance for the way you will bless this work for your cause and glory. We ask these things in the name of Christ and for his sake alone. All God's people said, amen. Please be seated.
The longest battle in human history is still raging. Day and night, constantly at work. It's not the kind of battle that causes bloodshed, doesn't involve heavy weapons and drones that fly over areas and, and cause explosions. It isn't from great bombers or fighting planes in the air. It isn't from ships at sea. It isn't even from forces between nations fighting one another. It's not that kind of fight or battle, but it is nevertheless real and relentless. I'm referring to the battle that rages within every one of us. The battle between good and evil goes on all the time. In fact, it goes on often when we're not prepared to face it or realize it's happening. You understand that uh, our problem is that we have lived with this evil nature all our lives. It's not something that's just been discovered or pointed out by some theologians somewhere in recent years. This problem goes back all the way to the beginning of life. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? Remember the Lord's words to them? Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. That tells us that had they not eaten of that forbidden fruit, they would have lived forever. There would have been no death. But upon eating of the fruit, death was introduced along with the presence of sin, which brought evil into life. I often think of it as a clear, pristine stream that flows and you're free to drink from it, enjoy it, it's beautiful. But then suddenly pollution is added to the stream and it becomes diseased and unhealthy. And no longer the, the beautiful stream it once was. So it is in the human bloodstream. Centuries after that scene in the garden, Paul wrote in Romans 5:12. Through one man, that would be Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death passed upon all men and women, for all have sinned. It's hard for some to believe this because it's teaching that <clears throat> is rarely heard, certainly is not taught in schools of higher learning, certainly is not found in the media or in present day information in the evening news or wherever. In fact, it's denied. But we're all sinners. It's called the doctrine of human depravity. We're as bad off as we could possibly be from birth on. That's right, from birth on. The psalmist writes in Psalm 51, 5, I was born in iniquity, for my mother who conceived me was a sinner. I too am sinful. Psalm 58, 3 adds that because of this sinful nature, I go astray from birth. Interesting, you, you never have to teach a child to do wrong. You always have to teach them to do what's right. Why? Because of that nature. There's a nature within every one of us that craves wrongdoing. 
I remember back when I began to write books, that would be in the mid-70s, <clears throat> one of my earliest books was a, a work I entitled, You and Your Child. Uh, I remember coming to a place in the book where I, I needed an illustration that would clarify the issue of human depravity, and I gave my mentor, Ray Stedman, a call. And I asked Ray, if, uh, as he listened to me, as I described this, this book I was putting together, uh, I said, I, I need something that illustrates that we do, in fact, go astray from the birth, from, from birth. And he said, interesting, you were to, you're calling me. I've just gotten back from uh, a ministry in another state. And he said, I came across uh, a statement from the Minnesota Crime Commission. Now, this was back in 1976, as I recall. Whether or not they still agree with their position from back then, I can't say. But this is the piece he sent to me, and I used in the book, as a matter of fact. Listen to these words. Every baby starts life as a little savage. <laughs> he is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch. Deny these and he seethes with rage and aggressiveness which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He is in fact dirty. He has no morals no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his infancy, given free reign to his impulsive uh, actions to satisfy his wants, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, or a rapist. Your response is exactly mine when I first read it. That is, Stunning information. Perhaps things within you resist that. But pause and think. Can you support your position from the scriptures? Or do you support it from your opinion? And you can't go by the sweetness of a little baby or the loveliness of that little child as, as you are rearing him or her. Just remember the temper tantrums, the moments where you have lost control and some other control has taken over. And by the way, good advice, never ignore a temper tantrum. What we witness on the streets today is often the result of a family that has been in dysfunction or an absent father, or a neglecting set of parents. Poor upbringing, lack of discipline, inattention to the nature of every child. We look in disbelief as we see such brutality, open, open thievery on the streets and in stores, and we wonder, how could that be? There's your answer. Every child is born delinquent. This is not a piece written against children. It's a piece about the nature within all of us. Now, the sad news is it never gets better. 
the evil nature remains evil. And as we grow older, it takes on creative expressions of all sorts. None of them pleasant, all of them with consequences. The person, him or herself, suffers those consequences and those around them often suffer consequences from the evil nature as it is expressed by the individual. Why do I begin a message on the fruit of the Spirit like this? Because it's the beginning of this force within us that causes that battle I mentioned earlier. Because our evil nature needs to be curbed. We need something within us to tap the brakes, to restrain us, to keep us from adult temper tantrums, from rage, from assault, from abuse, from those things that occur when life goes out of control. Now, I wish I could tell you that all of this that I have talked about is only true of the lost person. But hold on. Even though you are a Christian, the same evil dwells within you and within me. It doesn't go away. It isn't eradicated because Christ has come to live within us. I sometimes hear about preachers that make the declaration from the pulpit that our sin nature is eradicated because we now have the Spirit of God. I always want to visit with that person's wife and ask, is that true? Have you noticed that his, his sinful nature has been eradicated? Never. There's a side within all of us that is like Mark Twain put it, we're all like the moon. We have a dark side. We don't want anybody to see. But sometimes it's on display. Acts of impatience and impulsiveness. Acts of greed and selfishness. Lack of forgiveness. Refusal to accept others as they are. All from a nature within us that is wrong with God. We're born like that. As dear and important as they were to us, our mothers and fathers had evil natures. Their mothers and fathers had such natures, and their mothers, and all the way back to Adam and Eve, who acted as our federal head. When they fell into sin, we all sin. No one is ever born right with God. That's why we need a new birth. And the good news is, with the new birth, when Christ comes to live in our lives, he brings with him an internal power that can curb the evil nature. It can do that, but it isn't automatic. That's why I say, one can be a Christian and still act out in ways that we're going to see are just like a lost person. When they do, they move into a carnal state in their lives. That's why Christians can have affairs. That's why Christians can curse when they are angry. Why Christians can throw fits, or stir the pot, or break families apart, or abuse children, 
and the, and, and, the, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Why? Because the nature is there and it will not change until we go to be with the Lord. You will have this nature within you, Christian friend, as long as you are on this earth. <laughs> Once we die, our, we are changed from within and in a, get this, in a glorified state. Our bodies are taken to be with heaven, joined with our spirit, and there we exist without that evil nature any longer. There's a great old song we used to sing, a wonderful hymn. The last stanza almost sounds like a tongue twister. Listen to it. Then we shall be as we should be. It slips me, it's so much of a tongue twister. Then we shall be as we should be, then we shall be, then we will do what we should do. Things that are not now nor should be soon shall be our own. I fouled it up, but it's, it's talking about our nature at this time on this earth is such that we cannot change it. And it will take death to separate it from us. So here we are, stuck with an evil nature, even though Christ has come to live within us, bringing a power to curb that nature. How does it happen? We yield to the Spirit and trust Him to control our evil bents. We must do that every day, from one day to the next. Then we shall be what we would be, then we shall be what we should be, Things that are not now nor could be soon shall be our own. Thanks, Lord. I got it back. <laughs> I wasn't going to end this sermon without saying it correctly. <laughs> and even though I've said it, you're going, what? <laughs> Sounds strange. Of course it does. We long to be what we're not because we can't pull it off. If you read Romans 7, it's a story of Paul himself who says, the good that I would do, I do not do, and the evil that I don't want to do, I find myself constantly doing. Then he ends the chapter with, wretched man that I am. Why does he see himself as wretched? Because he cannot curb this evil nature on his own. So he throws up his hands at the end of the chapter saying, is there any hope? Can I get any way to conquer this? And then the next chapter introduces the work of the Holy Spirit, chapter eight of Romans. Now, having said all of this, I want you to look at Galatians chapter five, which presents this all out war between the evil and the good within us. Yes, every one of us. Yes, including you. Yes, including me. Every one of us on this earth, except Christ, who was born free of a sin nature, which makes the virgin birth important. Really, it's the virgin conception. Only he came through a virgin and was therefore not contaminated with sin and became the sinless sacrifice for us that was acceptable to God. But we, born of our parents, come with their nature. So Galatians 5 addresses this all-out war that goes on. If you will notice here in this verse 16, there is a statement regarding that, that uh, ongoing battle. There is this evil nature called, maybe in your Bible, the flesh, that is at war against the spirit. 
And he says, let the Holy Spirit guide our lives. Then you won't be doing what the flesh craves. There it is for you. There's the battle. Let the Holy Spirit guide our lives. You see, there's a choice. You must make it for yourself. I must make it for myself. When I am tempted to look with lust, I turn the lust over to the Spirit of God and he curbs the lust. He stops the desire. He alters the direction of my thinking so that my thought is purified rather than becoming, becoming increasingly more contaminated. That can be done only through the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't have that kind of power in myself. So I must add, if you are without Christ, you are at the mercy of your flesh. When the flesh rears its ugly head, you will yield. Even though you don't want to, it will happen. You have no power to stop it. The only way to gain the power is through the fruit of the Spirit that is produced by the Holy Spirit. Now you understand why I'm excited about this series. I want to address the fruit of the Spirit. But before I do, let's do what Paul does. Let's notice these deeds of the flesh. He names 15 of them in verses 19 to 21. Look for yourself. They're all listed for us here. I've divided them into four categories. First, there are sexual sins that come from the flesh. Among them would be uncontrolled lust, adultery, fornication, sexual perversions, prostitution, pornography, those dark sins in the realm of one's sexual life. You're saying, Chuck, you're saying to me that a Christian can do those things? I'm saying that because we have that evil nature. I'm saying we don't have to because we have the power of the Spirit to control that nature. Without him, we are at the mercy of the, of the flesh. When we act out in this way, we move into a realm, as I mentioned earlier, of carnality. And get this, carnal Christians look just like lost people. The world can't tell the difference. When they see a Christian act out in these ways, they don't know that you're a Christian. They would doubt that you are because you're acting just like they would. But when it's curbed within us, they see the difference. The next category would be what we would call religious sins. Look for yourself. This would be occult activities, false religions, new age spirituality, idolatry, superstition, spiritism. These in the realm of religion can take place because of the evil nature within us. The third would be social sins. These would be things that are destructive to our lives and those around us, our churches, our communities, our families, like slander, gossip, harboring bitterness, bearing grudges, taking revenge, road rage, a lack of forgiveness, physical and verbal abuse, unjust and unnecessary lawsuits against one another, social sins. And then there are personal sins against one's own body like addictions, drug or alcohol abuse, bar hopping, gluttony, workaholism, and other self-destructive behaviors. There it is for you. And by the way, notice it's not an exhaustive list. He says, 
and such things as these. The list could have gone on and on and on. Our evil nature is able to produce any one of these things. And to make matters worse, it craves to do so. And it has been craving to do so since our earliest years. So you can imagine how intense the battle becomes when the Spirit of God comes to live within us and suddenly engages the evil nature within us and there is this back and forth flesh and spirit battle that if ignored, you will live just like you were lost. You will not live as a believer should live. So for that reason, the battle can overwhelm us unless we decide we're going to re release the power of the Spirit to take charge in our lives. You're still in Galatians 5. Look at verses 22 and 23. We're not left to guess what those qualities are that the Spirit can produce. Here is a, cluster, here's a cluster of delicious virtues, that, if you will, uh, that are far superior to anything the flesh can produce. You just read them earlier. Listen to the words again. Ponder them. Love, which is seeking the highest good of the other person. Joy, refusing to live in the doldrums, moving out from under the cloud, out into the bright sunshine of God's joy full of anticipation from one day to the next. And then peace, freedom from worry, freedom from dread. The Spirit of God, look at this fourth one, whoa. Talk about convicting, patience. You, you aren't patient within yourself. You, you, you're, you're in a hurry. You want your prayer answered now. You want your disease healed now. You want change to come now. You want your wayward son or daughter back now. The patience involved in all of those and so many other areas must come from the Spirit. And then kindness, one of my favorite words. Spirit of God can produce kindness. I knew a president of a university who had been through quite a bit in his life, and as a result, he was full of compassion and ministered to the, to the students in his school with compassion and understanding. One was a lady who had to leave for difficult reasons, and he, through great kindness and compassion, won her back, and she finished her work at the school, and just before graduating, she sat down and gifted with handwork that she was able to do. She spelled out with uh, the use of uh, yarn and, and threads on, on fabric, she spelled out the words kindness spoken here and gave him that little piece of fabric with those words, if you will, embroidered on the, the fabric when she graduated. He had those words framed and they hung in the hallway leading into his office. Before you went to meet with him, you read in the hallway, kindness spoken here. We don't naturally speak kindly. We are not naturally good. We hold grudges. We have a list of people we don't want to be around. We, uh, we have pushback, and we feel it from others. Uh, kindness and goodness come from the Spirit of God. And how about this erratic nature within all of us? 
up and down, sometime reliable, sometime not, easily forgetting what we said we would do, not living up to our vows. The Spirit of God is faithful, and He produces that within us. And then gentleness, and then self-control. Against these things, there, there is, there are no consequences. There is no law. Don't you long to have those qualities in your life? I'm going to talk about how that can happen. I'm going to analyze each of these nine virtues in, in, in the Sundays ahead. We're going to look at each one carefully. We're not going to hurry through them. And I'm going to urge you to let the Spirit of God take charge so that the flesh will be pushed back and held in control. Uh, uh, I've never shared a particular uh, dream in my life with everyone, so I'm prepared to do it today and to close my message with it. A rather fanciful dream, I admit. So give me a few moments to develop it. When I was a little boy, I took piano. Uh, that's not the dream, by the way. I, I said I took piano, I didn't say I enjoyed it. And the only thing I perfected was chopsticks. It's just as boring as it sounds. And I would play that when I'd sit down. My mother just lost it. Well, she wasn't under the control of the spirit when she talked with me during <laughs> times when I would play chopsticks. Let me put it that way. Uh, and finally, after two years, I quit and uh, took up other instruments, which I enjoyed playing. But uh, I, I, I never did perfect. So, as a result, when I see people who can play the piano magnificently, I, I, I mean piano virtuosos, that can sit down and their fingers move blithely across the keyboard and like, like moving across silk. And they play these difficult pieces by these composers that write the music that is so different and they can play it from memory of all things. And they sit down, and they play it without mistake. Now I'm, I want to tell you now, my little fancy, my little hidden envy, I sometime wish I had that gift, that ability, okay? Now, uh, I'm not able to produce it in myself. So stay with me. Uh, I admire someone like Stephen Nielsen, who plays beautiful piano. A friend of mine traveled with us at various events. He and, and Ovid Young uh, used to play piano duets together, and they would just hold audiences in rapt attention. You who love music have probably attended times, and they've even done their concerts here and on our events with Insight for Living. Uh, Ovid has now been uh, taken home to be with the Lord, so Stephen is, remains and still does concerts, still plays beautifully. Let's say we invited Stephen to a concert at our church, and I think he would accept and he would come, and I would say to him, Stephen, I want you to play some of your favorite pieces. And he would sit down, and the place would be full of music-loving people, and his fingers would go all over the keyboard. And after about 30, 35 minutes, we would take a break, uh, kind of an intermission. And let's just imagine Stephen saying to me, Chuck, I want you to come up and join me on, on, the, on, on the piano. Uh, sitting on the bench. Well, uh, after uh, <laughs> a little moment of hesitation, I would make my way up and I would sit down and he would say to me, you know, I have an ability that uh, no one knows about. I, I, can, I can help you play just like I play. But you have to rely on me to do it. I'm going to go around behind you and I'm going to Put my hand, stay with me, okay? Stay with me. I'm going to put my hands on your shoulders. And I'm going to whisper in your ears, 
Okay, trust me right now, and you and I are gonna play this Mozart piano piece. And I, my tendency is to go to chopsticks, but he's gonna say, just trust me and rely on me. And, and you know what? I began to play Mozart. <laughs> So I'm going all over the piano. He says, now remember, if you start feeling pretty important to yourself, uh, I'm out of control and you're back to chopsticks. So uh, just rely on me. So I, I say, okay, don't worry, man. Let's go. So I play some Tchaikovsky. I play some Beethoven, some Bach. And I, I, I'm, I'm doing Mozart. And Steve's got his hand on my shoulders. And, and before long, I'm thinking, boy, they're all watching. I'm doing this without mistake. Look at me. And I'm back to chopsticks. What happened? Well, uh, I no longer relied on him to play the piano through me. Every morning of your life, Every day you live, you have a choice. The Spirit of God, as it were, whispers to you, if you will rely on me today, at every turn of your life, at every moment, tough times, hard times, difficult moments, I will live out my love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control through you. Trust me. And you know what, men and women? You will be transformed just as I would be transformed at the piano with this fine musician standing behind me, infusing me with his ability to play this instrument that I couldn't on my own ever manage to play. There is a life called the spirit-filled life waiting for you to live. But only you can make that decision. As much as I long for it for you, I can't make it for you. I can't yield to the Spirit on your behalf. Just as you couldn't as I'm at the piano bench, only the Master could with his hands on my shoulders. During these days ahead, I'm going to be talking about the importance of walking in the Spirit with the evidence of these nine qualities at work. One final, one final caveat here. If you're without Christ, I have no message for you until you trust in Him because you won't have the Spirit of God. In order for you to have this power within you, you must know the Savior. You must come to Christ. And as he invades your life, he brings with him this inner strength that you lack and have lacked all of your life. And he will live out his life through you in such a way that you cannot believe the transformation that will take place. Please bow with me. <clears throat> There's never been a time in your life when you've invited Christ to take charge. Now is the time. Simple prayer, Lord, right now, I give you my life and I take yours. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for the promise of hope and eternal life. Thank you for the Spirit of God who will now invade me and give me the power I need to live as I've always wanted to live. 
Thank you, Christ, for coming into my life. If you've made that decision, please contact us. Let us help you get started in a walk that will never end as you move from earth to heaven, transformed by the power of the Spirit of God. Thank you, Father, for your message today that has come through your word. May we begin to see the power of love, joy, peace, patience. May we come to know kindness and goodness and faithfulness. May the truth of, of these wonderful pieces of fruit in virtue form take place in our life. May they become a reality, even gentleness and self-control. Begin that soon, Lord, as we get into this study and open our hearts to a whole new way of life that we will live for your glory and grace. This I ask through Christ, our Lord and Savior. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Everyone said, Amen. Amen.